You were you two both fans of comics growing up in the seventies and stuff as well? I was for sure. I mean, you must have been. Yeah, he was actually a rock and roller. He was a heavy metal guy with long hair. You know? <laughs> so you were you were exposed to you know comics that had to be approved by the Comic Code Association, correct? Then? I, um, oh yeah. Um, do you find that having that restrictions in the stories that you grew up reading also helped when um, you start making your comics to want to just dive out of stories that were so like restricted and rule based? Or was that something that you feel has absorbed into your art by having that censorship exposed to you from such a young age? I well, for me, it was not too much of an issue because I wanted to draw a comic strip. Mm -hmm. So I was shooting for something that would appeal to the whole family, you know, to the to the not only to the kids that read the comics, but to the dads and moms who paid for the newspaper. Yeah. yeah. So. I was going that route anyway. Um, I do remember when early on when I was about four issues in, when I was just starting to get attention, people wanted to know, well, when's Thor going to take the shirt off? Because it was an underground comic. It was a black and white comic, and they just assumed that, you know, eventually they're going to, we're going to get, you know, we're going to start taking drugs and sex and rock and roll. But that wasn't what we were doing at all. In fact, it was, Scott McCloud kind of pointed out that there was the original underground, which was rebellious. They were against the man, you know, and they were, you know, they wanted to break all the rules intentionally. They did a lot of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And we, however, were a, a generation that wanted to tell our stories. We were, we were like authors. We had our own characters, our own situations. So, and I think that was all started by the brothers, the Hernandez brothers. Uh, so, but it, it was slowly, slowly that built up, and we had Cerebus following sure. Yeah, and, and just, you know, the, um, I mean, you guys certainly were inspired by the, the kind of idea from the undergrounds that you could, you could tell your own stories. You didn't need to go through Marvel and DC. That right. You had that freedom, but you also realized that actually, you know, Stories about acid trips might get a little boring, um, as they did even for you know Mark Spiegelman and company. So that's yeah. what I liked about comics was that when I was, I had come from uh, television editing, that was my career before, and that was created by committee. We need a lot of people to approve everything. Uh, so I've been doing that for eleven years, and I was really tired of creating by committee. Because you end up, it's it was like the game show The Weakest Link. You end up chopping off the left and the right, right. extreme ideas, and you end up there. Oh, you're always in there. Everything's down to right? Yeah, and so I love what I loved about comics was that you can do whatever you want. You don't have a visual budget. If I want to blow out every window in Manhattan, I can. I wouldn't ever want to draw that, but I can <laughs> do that if I want to. So I loved the the appeal of it. It was I could tell my story like. I had a movie in my head, I could draw it, publish it, uh, five minutes at a time, a chapter at a time, and it's out. And then I can I can get finally get that one great story out of my head and then move on and make new stories. I mean, I won't have to keep refining it or doing part two, part three. Yeah, no, I remember I, I we had a brief email uh, interview when you were um, wrapping up uh, Echo and I was, I kind of hadn't yet known that you were kind of wrapping it up, and you were like, no, I'm, I'm kind of done with that. Like, I've, I've already got the plot out, done. Like, and you were already clearly, even in that correspondence, I could tell, like, you were onto your next project. Like, you had, you had a whole new kind of, it's like a filmmaker, but now you're a studio onto yourself. You were ramping up a whole new set of characters and and sets and, and getting ready for a new a new story world. And you know what's weird about that? Because in, in the world of cartooning, the goal, your life goal, is to find your definitive character, your character of a lifetime. And yeah. that's your ride for life. Yeah. And in comic strips. strips. In comic strips. Yeah. But that was, <coughs> that's where I came from. I came right. from comic strips, and I'm, I'm a comic strip failure. But my, <laughs> my, whole, comic strip failure. my yeah. whole point was I need to come up with my icon, and then I'm, that's, my, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So but you both came up with your icons and then walked away from them. Well, we thought, I mean, I thought I would, when I started it, I thought that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. But 
then, there's another side to that, you start to think, well, on the other hand, I don't want to become Blondie. <laughs> Everybody's heard of Blondie and nobody reads it. <laughs> that's that's yeah. what you're waiting for. That, that's what's waiting for you, unless you have a wonderful marketplace that just yeah. comes <clears throat> rotating with your ships. Right. Otherwise, you just be great if you could like, get it into like a children's publisher and they just kept putting the main line in your account right into school. Oh, wait, that's what I did with Scholastic. <laughs> <laughs> that is 